Good afternoon. We turn our attention now to the Middle East, which is certainly the focal point of the current crisis. And we see the jigsaw puzzles of the geopolitical scene that God has painted in his word of prophecy that we've all been so keen for so many years to, to read, all coming together. I remember 1989, there was a night where the Berlin Wall came down where everyone was so excited. I remember staying up late that night following the events on the radio. I remember two such nights this year that reminded me of that excitement. One was Brexit, the night of Brexit, when the world was not expecting Britain to leave the EU, but in fact it happened, contrary to expectations, but not, as Brother Don has said, contrary to uh, our expectations. And then the other night was, much, was more recently, and that is the coup in Turkey. We are seeing the world lurch forward. Sometimes the Middle East simmers, but we've seen it lurch forward in the plan of God in the last few months. Concentrating on the Middle East, this is the area that we're going to talk about today. We can see Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Israel being the epicentre of it all, of course. Jordan, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, Iran and Egypt to some extent. Sometimes the area that we're talking about is called the Levant. In fact, that's ISIL, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. The Levant means the rising of the sun. And there's biblical overtones in that phrase, isn't there? Uh, but it refers to the eastern Mediterranean, and that's the east from which the sun rises. But, of course, we're going to see another sun rise there soon, the Levant. There are four key Bible prophecies that are basic, are fundamental to the framework of our understanding of what's to come. Daniel 2, Ezekiel 38, Daniel 11 and Joel 3. In Daniel chapter 2, we see the image stand on its feet. Then let the reader know that the end of all things is at hand, said Brother Thomas. For 150 or more years, we've been standing by expecting these things to happen and we're starting to see those jigsaw puzzle pieces come together. We're starting to see the image stand upon its feet. Thou sawest till a stone was cut out with our hands, in other words, with God's hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold that is, the territories of those empires which those metals represent, stand up and be broken to pieces together. And so we expect this map that's represented on the screen to come together as a big world empire. Alongside Daniel 2 is Ezekiel 38. And in Ezekiel 38 we have described two opposing alliances or confederacies of nations. The first is the alliances which is going to come against Israel including Russia, described as the Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, Persia, modern Iran, Libya and Ethiopia, all of them with shield and helmet, in other words, well armed. We have Gomer there mentioned in verse 6 and all his bands, the house of Tagama of the North Quarters, which is the area we're very interested in, in uh, the, era, the region of Turkey. So these are all in one confederacy and then against them, as Brother Don has spoken about, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof, which includes our country, without question. Now, 30 years ago, I can remember giving talks about this, and I used to use this old map on an old overhead transparency. And uh, I, I, I scanned it in because I, I just think, uh, for me, it represents the fact that this message we have been expounding from Scripture is age old. It has not changed. And so the map that is represented here is the map that we see falling into place in the world as we speak, with all the red nations coming together in an alliance of kinds, and, and the green nations, that is Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, being isolated on their own. And we've seen that in extraordinary ways. So that map there represents the extraordinary confederacy that's going to threaten Israel and invade Israel successfully and take Israel, albeit briefly. You'll notice that uh, Sheba and Dedan and Tarshish are in green, uh, and you can see just by mere size that they're going to be overwhelmed, uh, which explains their rather feeble response in Ezekiel 38, have you come to take a spoil, which is as much as they can do to mount opposition. You'll notice also that Egypt, although not clear from Ezekiel 38, is in a slightly different colour to both red and green, and that is it's sort of a bone colour, 
representing the fact that Egypt will not actually be part of the Confederacy, but Daniel 11 presents that Egypt will actually be invaded. So when we uh, put Daniel 2 and Ezekiel 38 together, we can see that these two maps coalesce, they align, they're consistent. Bible prophecy presents a consistent picture. When we add to that Daniel chapter 11, we see even more details. We see the king of the north, which originally, uh, when Daniel wrote it, was, was meaning the, uh, the power in, in control of Constantinople, or if you like, the Seleucid power, which also takes in Turkey and the northern region of the Middle East. The Seleucid power, which uh, King Seleucus was one of the uh, generals that took over after Alexander. And they're going to enter into the country south of the king of the north, Turkey, Syria, Lebanon and Iraq, and he shall overflow and pass over, uh, just like sweeping down. Ezekiel 38 says, like a cloud to cover the land, just this enormous confederacy moving south. Daniel 11 describes that it's going to move through very quickly the coastal plain of Israel being geographically the easiest uh, territory to take and also the fact that there's the Gaza Strip there who will also be allied uh, to the invading confederacy. Uh, we're told that the Libyans and Ethiopians will be his allies and that he will sweep down into Egypt and invade it. In opposition to that confederacy... Edom, Moab and, and uh, most of Ammon will escape the chief of the children of Ammon, which of course represents Jordan. And so Jordan obviously is an area to which the Jews flee when the Russians take Jerusalem and set the headquarters of their palace in Jerusalem. And two-thirds, Zechariah tells us, of the Jews will be killed and one-third will remain and, and escape through Jordan and to this area of Sheba and Dedan where the merchants of Tarshish are located. And so if we look at the map of what uh, Daniel 11 presents, we have this overwhelming force coming from the north, sweeping down through the coastal plain to Egypt. Here's tidings from the north and the east which bring, back, bring the force back to uh, Israel and takes Jerusalem. And there he will come to his end. But prior to coming to his end, he will set up the headquarters of his palace, his headquarters in that holy mountain. And the Jews will flee... Merchants of Tarshish and Young Lions and Sheba and Dedan will be secure in that area of Saudi Arabia. So there's Daniel 11, adding to our picture of Daniel 2, Ezekiel 38. Added to that, we have Joel 3, which describes Armageddon in these terms, I will gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will plead with them there. And verse 4 says, Yea, and what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon and all the coasts of Palestine? So in Joel 3, we have... Uh, Tyre and Zidon and the coast of Palestine mentioned, which correlates to the area of Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Gaza Strip, the coast of Palestine, where Hamas is located. And so on the map we have Tyre and Zidon, where we know the uh, Iranian-motivated uh, Hezbollah is located, and the coast of Palestine, where the other terrorist group of the Palestinians is located, which, by the way, if you've given money to World Vision in the last 12 months, probably is funding that very organisation, as the Adelaide Advertiser reported this morning. When we look... So they're, the, they're four of the major key prophecies, uh, which all coalesce and give us a, a fairly good picture. And now, as we look at world events, we can see these things coming to pass in remarkable ways in our own times. When we go back and look at the map of the Middle East before World War I, it's a very different picture... We have the Ottoman Empire. It was the sick man of Europe at the time and was, uh, was, was dying, but it was still there in control of Israel. We had the British in Egypt and down in the area of Yemen and Amman, down the bottom of Saudi Arabia. And really we just had the, Brit the British in Egypt, the Ottoman Empire, the Persian Empire and the Arabs. And that's how things looked at the beginning of World War I. After World War I, it was a very different picture. The country of Iraq emerged, the French mandate of Syria emerged, and Iraq was under British control and the French uh, had a mandate over Syria, and the broad region of Palestine also came into being, and Lebanon. We don't have the country of Israel yet, and we don't have the region of Jordan either, but we're starting to see the modern Middle East take shape, which is very different to the map that existed prior to the start of World War I. So we, we saw it start to emerge. One of the things we need to understand about the Middle East, and probably you've heard talk of this, is the 
conflict between two sets of Islam, the Sunnis and the Shias, who have been struggling over control and uh, dominance of the Islamic world for many years. In fact, Muhammad, their prophet, died in 632, and, and after only 22 years of religious leadership, he left it to his uh, descendants or those that would take control after him. And it was this very issue, who would take control of Islam after his death, that was the source of all the fighting. The Shia Muslims support the view that his nephew Ali was the legitimate successor and that succession from then on as caliph should be based upon hereditary succession. The Sunnis, on the other hand, supported the election of a caliph uh, by democratic vote and supported Muhammad's prominent companion uh, Abu Bakr as caliph. And so really this is the, uh, the uh, origin of much of today's conflict in the Islamic world. The first Arab civil war, the Battle of Sifan, over this issue took place in July 657. So it's only 25 years or so after the death of Muhammad. And it took place in a city called Arakar on the Euphrates, now in modern Syria. Now, the, the, the significance of this particular location is that it's the very place where ISIS set up their headquarters very recently, in March 2013. It was the first regional centre to be taken by the rebels in the Syrian civil war. And it has been bombed by Syria in, recent, in, in the recent conflict by, by Syria, by the USA, by the French, by the Russians, all bombing this very place. And so it becomes a significant as a central location for this ongoing struggle. The Middle Eastern countries with the greatest proportion of Sunnis are Egypt, Jordan and Saudi Arabia. Egypt... Jordan and Saudi Arabia. These are the countries that are going to be uncertain or certainly not supportive of, uh, of the Russians and their confederacy. In fact, Saudi Arabia and Jordan will remain outsider in Egypt only when it's taken over by the Russians as described in Daniel 11. And so we can see that this Sunnis versus the Shias is a very significant battle. Just to identify that Arakar location, which is the site of the first battle between uh, the Sunnis and the Shias, is in the hands of ISIS as we speak. ISIL recaptures areas from Syrian forces in Raqqa. ISIL fighters launch counter-offensive in the northern province of Raqqa. Now, when we look at the map of Sunnis versus Shias, we see a northern sway through Syria, Iraq, Iran, uh, which are dominated by the Shias. And those countries in blue on this map are countries where the Sunnis are dominant. And it's, we need to understand this, this tension between these two sects of Islam to understand how things are going to turn out in God's purpose. In fact, if we see it there, it's almost a map without Turkey. And Turkey's going to be invo invaded, we believe, by Russia. But already there is a, a swathe of the old Seleucid Empire that is already allied to Russia. And once Russia takes Turkey, they've got their confederacy in place. And yet you've got this Sunni area, which is Saudi Arabia and Egypt, uh, that is exactly in line with what we're expecting Bible, from Bible prophecy, from those four key prophecies we've mentioned earlier. And you've got this conundrum of Yemen down the bottom there, which we expect to be also Sunni, but in Yemen you've got about 50-50 You've got about 50% to 50% Sunni versus Shia, slightly more Sunnis, and there's a civil war going on there right now. And we, we can predict, can't we, from Bible prophecy, how that civil war will take shape. It's also important to understand that not all Islamic countries are Arab countries. This is the Arab League countries. You'll notice that Persia or Iran is not one of them. Turkey is not one of them. They are non-Arabic speaking Muslim countries, but the Arab League countries are all Arabic speaking. So turning to Iran then in, in, in more detail, this is an ancient civilization. This is the civilization of Persia. And uh, after World War I, we had Reza Shah, Shah just means king, in control of Iran. And he modernised Iran and brought it into uh, the 20th century, changed the name from Persia to Iran, and he moved Iran away from Britain towards Germany as a trading partner. And... Uh, he was deposed after Britain and Russia actually invaded Iran in World War I. And as a matter of fact, uh, sorry, in World War II. As a matter of fact, um, 
Australians, the Australian Navy was part of the attack on Iran. We had some ships in the Persian Gulf along with the British and the British were coming in from Iraq in the south, the Russians from the north and there's this unusual situation where the, where the British and the Russians fought together over this, over this country and they'll be on opposing sides uh, from now on. In fact, when the, uh, the map was drawn uh, by uh, the British troops, they had this supply line and, and it was important, as you can see, from getting troops from the south to Russia because Germany controlled so much of Europe at that time, Russia needed uh, supply lines and it was for that purpose that, they, that the British and the Russians got together and took uh, Iran. And this is a map of those supply lines. And here we have British and Soviet officers inspecting the troops in preparation for a joint Russo-British military parade in Tehran uh, in Iran in September 1941. And so we had the, the British and the Russians cooperating in dividing up Persia. But things changed in 1941 because the British deposed uh, Reza Shah because he was pro-German and they put in his place his son, uh, the last and final Shah. In fact, it was during his reign that the Persians enjoyed 2,500 year anniversary of constant uh, monarchy on their ancient civilization, going right back to Cyrus the Great. And the 2,500 years uh, was during his reign. He succeeded his father. The British and the West made a deal with him that they'd, they'd support his rule as long as he supported them. He was a secular Muslim. He nationalised the oil industry. He made Iran very prosperous. He was a staunch ally of the US and the West. And the US guaranteed they would protect him. And he also had close ties with Saudi Arabia. And he was the first regional leader to recognise Israel as a state. Uh, which they would never do today. Um, and he was seen by many of his people, particularly the Shia clerics who were opposed to him, as a puppet of the US, which ultimately brought his demise. There he is meeting in the White House Cabinet Room in 1962 with Defence Secretary Robert McNamara and JFK, showing how close he was to America. Well, everything changed in Iran in 1979, the, the absolute key date in the history of the development of modern Iran, the, the Iran we have facing us today. And this revolution changed the nature of the Middle East and the world. And we can see the Shia cleric's face plastered all over the billboards. And this revolution ousted the Shah and brought into power the most conservative of Shia clerics. And we can see in that billboard, Shah is the US puppet down with the Shah and a fist coming down on his head, and so it did. And a new con constitution was brought in Iran, which uh, set up the first supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini, he reigned from 79 to 89. His attitude was very different to the West. The Americans, he said, are the great Satan, the wounded snake. And so, as far as the Americans were concerned, it was Iran now versus the world. He reigned, as I say, for 10 years, and, and when he passed away, there was a second supreme leader that came to power, and he's still in power to this day. Uh, Ali Khomeini, from 1989 till today, What's uh, changed is the whole nature of the country. And his attitude to Israel, he said in 2000, Israel is a cancerous tumour of a state that should be removed from the region. In 2013, he called Israel a rabid dog. In 2014, he said that there was no cure for Israel, but it's annihilation. They're, they're not backward in coming forward and declaring their views on Israel. In fact, they don't even talk about Israel. They talk about the Zionist regime. To talk about Israel would to be admit that it has, has legitimate existence. So they talk about the Zionist regime, a rabid dog. Uh, alongside the two supreme leaders, who are the heads of state, we've had seven presidents in the, in the new uh, regime in, in Iran, the sixth of which was this man, Mah Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who, uh, ruled from 2000, who was president for 2009 to 2013. What he said about Israel is no secret either. The corrupt element will be wiped off the map, he said. I want to tell them, Western countries, just as the Soviet Union was wiped out and today does not exist, so will the Zionist regime soon be wiped out. Notice Zionist regime. There is no doubt that the new wave in Palestine will soon wipe off this disgraceful blot, referring to Israel, from the face of the Islamic world. Well, he, he was president until 2013 when the current president came to power for four years, from 2013 to 2017. 
He is in, in place. His name is Hassan Rouhani. And although he has slightly moderated his language towards Israel, he, shul, he still describes Israel as an occupier and usurper government that does injustice to the people of the region and has brought instability to the region with its warmongering policies. And so currently we have these two men in charge of Iran, President Hassan Rouhani and Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. Now these two have had to moderate their language slightly because they've had to consort with the West in their nuclear arms deal, which was for the purpose of raising the sanctions or lifting the sanctions which had been uh, crippling their country. And so they did. They did a deal with uh, the US and with uh, the EU and with the UN and sanctions were officially lifted this year on the 16th of January 2016. And part of the deal was of course that they stop their uh, nuclear facilities or the progress of building nuclear weapons and the nuclear sites there are on that map. They're, they're the ones we know of in any case, and they promised, uh, after 30 years of sanctions, that they would lift, that they would stop building these weapons in return for the sanctions being lifted. And in the deal, which was signed last year in July, 14th of July, it was signed. It was adopted in October last year. It was implemented on the 16th of January 2016 this year, and there's a transition day by 2024. The regular inspections will, will cease and the end of monitoring in 2025 is the ultimate aim. But of course really the doors of trade have been opened up to Iran which is going to change the whole nature of the country. And here we are with the world leaders on the implementation day on 16th of January 2016 which was the date on which this year everything changed for Iran. Netanyahu of course was very vocal in his opposition to this. He said, this is a bad mistake of historic proportions. He was advocating uh, that this would be a really bad move for the world, yet President Obama forged ahead. And this article says both Israel and Saudi Arabia, key US allies in the region, feel Washington is putting a deal with Iran before their security needs. And here we have Foreign Secretary John Kerry and the Iranian President Hassan Hourani shake hands on that nuclear deal. And we can see who has the cheeky grin on his face. Who's the happiest in the room on the day that that was signed? Here's another picture. Who's the happiest in the room? And uh, here he is again. Very happy man. Because it's opened up around to the world. And they can sell their oil. And more importantly, they can buy armaments and build up their military. At the same time, he's shaking... John Kerry's hand, we have grand leader, supreme leader, shaking Putin's hand because Iran has oil and gas for sale and Russia has weapons. We're open for business, says the supreme leader. And so it is wasting no time. Russia's latest weapons sale to Iran shifts the balance of Middle East power. Iran to spend $8 billion on Russian weapons and warplanes. And so already, in just a few months, We've had negotiations for weapons in Iran. And Iran vows to continue the military high-tech cooperation with Russia. And they've got advanced Russian defence systems in place. They've got fighter jets. They've got tanks being delivered. It's unprecedented. And Iran have huge wealth, a lot of money to spend, and they're spending it on Russian weapons. Now, turning our attention to Saudi Arabia in the Gulf states, we have uh, Saudi Arabia, Oman, U the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain, and out on its own a little bit at the moment, Yemen, but uh, we certainly believe that will come on board because that's Sheba, that's biblical Sheba, whereas Saudi Ar Arabia and the others are the Dedan of Ezekiel 38. In Saudi Arabia, we have a monarchy, not a Shia monarchy, but a Sunni mo monarchy. They're opposed to Shia monarchy that is, is in place in Iran, and we have... We've had King Abdullah from 2005 to 2015 and currently King Salman uh, from last year, January to the present. Um, Saudi Arabia is the land of two mosques because they have Medina and Mecca, the spiritual centre, if you like, alongside Jerusalem with the, with, with the, uh, the mosque that's there, the Dome of the Rock, very, the three most holy places. And uh, this is the centre of Islam. 
And it's, this uh, Saudi Arabian kingdom has been in place since 1932. It's a hereditary mo monarchy based on Islam. Uh, they discovered oil in 1938 in Saudi Arabia and has since become the world's largest oil producer and exporter, controlling the world's second largest oil reserves and the sixth largest gas reserves. So they are the centre of uh, the world energy economy. They're a very high income economy and the only Arab nation to be part of the G20. So they're very wealthy, very wealthy. Iran uh, wanting to become just as wealthy, but at the moment Saudi Arabia is also in a rush to buy arms, to counter Iran's attempt to buy arms. And in fact, Saudi Arabia has the fourth largest military expenditure in the world and is the world's second largest weapons importer. Saudi Arabia spends more than 10% of its GDP on military expenditure. And Saudi Arabia is buying arms. And the Saudis lead Middle East military spending. They're the fourth largest military uh, budget. The kingdom spent $67 billion in, in 2013. They're fourth behind the USA, China and Russia. And so we've got a huge build-up of arms in Sheba and Dedan going on. So we've got Saudi Arabia, Sunni versus Iran, Shia, and it's a simmering Cold War. They're two giants jostling for power. And the wars and the conflicts going on in Syria, going on in Iraq and going on in Yemen are proxy wars funded by these two great powerhouses. And if we look at the, the, the proven natural gas reserves in the Middle East, Iran is number one and Saudi Arabia is number four. And if we look at the Middle East proven oil reserves, Saudi Arabia and Iran are at the top of the list. And so these two countries are vying for power, vying for energy, vying for control. And all the other militant groups that are emerging, the rebel groups, are actually splinters of one or other of these two mighty powers. In fact, in 1979, when the Shi Shiites in Iran came to power, there were extremist groups of Shias emerged, like Hezbollah, the Dawah Party, the Islamic Supreme Council of Iraq, and Hezbollah in Lebanon. They're the Shia extremist groups. And at the other end, we have the Sunni extremist groups, the Islamic Front, al-Nusra, and ISIL, which came from the Sunni end of things. And uh, when they're taking over areas of uh, Syria and Iraq, ISIS have, I mean, Sunni don't really want to admit that, uh, that uh, ISIS represents Sunni in any way at all. They think they're crazy extremists. But when Sunnis have to fight against ISIS, they feel a bit awkward about it because, because they're really in some ways allied with them in uh, religious ideology. But uh, what we've really got going on is proxy wars. And so you've got Saudi Arabia pouring money into the wars in Syria, the disputes in Lebanon with, uh, that are against uh, the Hezbollah, which are Iranian-funded. So they're funding uh, groups in Lebanon and they're also funding groups in Egypt and Bahrain they're funding. On the other side, you've got Iran funding Al Bashar al-Assad, who's Shia. You've got uh, them funding uh, Nasrallah, Hassan Nasrallah, who's, who's Hezbollah. And... So Syria, Iraq and Lebanon all being funded by Iran. And so you've got these two powerhouses simmering away, fighting in the background over these territories. And it's, it's coming to a head, really. Uh, just in last month, actually, Iran calls Saudi Arabia father of al-Qaeda and ISIS. So Iran are placing all the blame of ISIS onto Saudi Arabia because they're funding these extremist Sunni groups. Whereas... Uh, you've got the Saudis, they're outraged by Iran, they're outraged by the nuclear deal, and they're even now, even though they don't admit Israel is a real, uh, a legitimate state, they're, they're visiting Israel. For the first time we have these secret meetings going on, there's been at least five secret meetings, and some of them not so secret because they've been reported in the newspaper, um, where the Saudis are actually visiting Israel and, and making deals. Khomeini, on the other hand, in Iran, is, is spotting these meetings and saying the Saudis' ties with Zionist regime are stabbing the back to Muslims. That, so they're trying to gain the upper hand as far as propaganda is concerned on this. He's even tweeting uh, these messages out to his followers. And in, uh, in Lebanon with Hezbollah, Hezbo the head of Hezbollah is saying that the Saudis are not supporting them. In fact, the Saudis are supporting the Zionist regime. 
And the Saudis have come out and said, well, Hezbollah is a terrorist group. And Hezbollah are outraged by this. So we can see that, that Sunni versus uh, Shia is part of the key to understanding what's going on in all these battles. And when we come to the war in Yemen, which goes on as we speak on a daily basis, we have a war over who's going to control biblical Sheba. And we kind of know what the outcome of this battle has to be in the short or medium term. Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states are united in the fight to preserve the Yemeni Sunni government. Yemen, which is Sheba, is in civil war. We've got the Houthi insurgents fighting for control of the country. And their aim, the Houthi, are, is to install the Shia government and Shia Islamic law. And I've noted there that even the USA have, have bought into this battle now and they're bombing uh, the Shia rebels and they're trying to reinstall the Sunni president. And as I've said, it's about 50-50 Sunni versus Shia and the battle goes on. And on the left, the purple, that's the, Shia end of, that's the Shia end of town and the Sunnis are in other territories. And we have the current president, who was Sunni, Mr Hadi, who from 2012 to the present was really the, the latest president, but he's had to flee to Saudi Arabia in the midst of this war because things are so uncertain. We've got Ali Abdullah Saleh, who was actually kicked out as part of the Arab Spring. He was in power for decades, and he was kicked out in 2012 as part of the Arab Spring. But he's back now, he's vying for power. So these are the two presidents that are really vying for power in Yemen, Sunni versus Shia again. And we have the Houthi insurgents, who are also Shia, uh, following their, their hero who died in 2004, but they're still a group that's also fighting for power. And Al-Qaeda are there as well, and ISIS have got their hand in Yemen as well, so it's a very complex picture. But essentially the front lines, if you simplify them, come down to the area in brown is, uh, is Shia, and uh, the area on the right is Sunni, and then we've got Al-Qaeda down in the south. Now, of course, all this was sparked by the Arab Spring. And we can see the nations that are affected by the Arab Spring. It started in Tunisia with one man standing up and burning himself to death in the town square, Mohammed uh, Bazizi, in, uh, in 2010. And in just a few years, the whole Arab world was turned upside down. Starting with Tunisia, the regime was overthrown. Moving on to Libya, regime overthrown. In Egypt, regime overthrown. These were regimes that had existed for decades. And then in Syria, well, the battle still goes on. Apart from these attempts at real regime change, there's also been unrest in Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Amman, Morocco, Bahrain, Algeria and Mauritania. All these Arab countries have been affected by the Arab Spring. But of course it's all come to the battle in Syria and and the dictator in Syria has not been so easy to overthrow. And so when we come to Syria and ISIS, uh, we, we need to understand that the Middle East was divided in sort of artificial terms during World War I by Pico and Sykes, the French and British uh, military leaders. In 1916, actually, in a secret deal, before the battle had even been won, they had made this secret deal that when we win, this is what we're going to do. We're just going to draw a line straight through the Middle East. You have the North, French, we'll have the South, British, and that's how it will go. Well, of course, they took no notice of the religious divide. They took no notice of, of the nationalities involved, the passions involved, and that line has been the cause of the conflict ever since, both in Syria and in Iraq, actually. And so when we look at the Syrian crisis, in order to understand the complexities of this, you need to see that it's actually really three wars going on simultaneously. There's a civil war going on between national groups that are vying for power. You've got a holy war going on between Shia and Sunni and the various sects within those. And you've got a cold war going on where you've got Saudi Arabia and Iran and the US and the West and Russia all vying for power. And so you've got this cold war going on where no one really admits that uh, this is really a, world, a worldwide battle in a way. It's just kind of like proxy. We'll all stand back and we'll, we'll prod and uh, we won't go to full-scale war. And so in civil, in, in civil war terms, you've got this, uh, this battle between political factions and interests. The Assad regime 
and his loyalist, President Assad, very reluctant to stand down. He's actually Shia, but in Syria, only 30% of the population is Shia. So he actually runs a minority dictatorship. 70% approximately are, are Sunni. And so you can see why he's so unpopular with his own people and why so many groups are so willing to fight against him. You've got also the Kurds, who are a national, nationalist group on their own. They believe they were, you know, in that Sykes-Picot agreement, who looked after the Kurds? Are we invisible people? We live up here. Where's our territory? They never got a territory and they're still battling for that. You've got the rebels, you've got Al-Qaeda, you've got ISIS, all fighting for power. And so you've got the civil war going on. And there's many other groups as well. The holy war is essentially between Sunni and Shia, between Assad's regime, which is Shia, which is the minority and the Sunnis who are opposed. And ISIS, of course, has Sunni uh, affiliations. And you've got this Cold War going on between the USA and Russia, between West and East, between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and it's a proxy war for regional power. And so with these things going on, it's, it's a very complex war. In terms of holy war, you've got Sunni Arabs, blue, you've got the Alawite Arabs, the Shia Arabs, Arabs, the Sunni Kurds up in the north, the yellow colour up there, and even some Yazidis, so a different uh, variety of Kurds. You've got the Christians, you've got the Druze Arabs, and you've got areas which are sparsely populated. So it's a complex holy war that's going on there. And in terms of the, the geopolitics of it, you've got the Syrian government controlling part now. You've got ISIS still fighting away there in the black areas on that map with Raqqa, Aleppo, Palmyra and so on. And you've got this conflict and the Kurds up north. And then as far as Cold War, war goes, you've got Russia putting their paws all over it. And the Russians move in. Secretly, at the time, and this is how they did it, they arrived underneath some much larger supply planes and they moved their aircraft in secretly into the Latakia airfield in Syria. And so the radar didn't pick up until they were there. They just appeared until the satellite image showed all these Russian planes on the ground. There are Russian planes in the Middle East for the first time for how long? What an extraordinary event. Amazing. The Latakia airfield airfield is, so Syria has this small length of Mediterranean coastline and uh, all, their, all their main infrastructure is over that, that side uh, and you've got the Latakia airfields and you've got the Tartus naval base and Russia has their equipment in both of those locations and they've run their sorties from there and just most recently in the, in the last map that has been put out in terms of Russian airstrikes, they're still going on. Even though Russia has pulled back a bit, he, they've taken some of their planes out, they're still there striking, and all those red and black spots represent Russian airstrikes that are going on right now. Russia uh, have their planes in action. And it's questionable whether this is true. It, it, there's some disputed uh, reports here, but Russia was reported to be sending its largest warship to Syria as Putin prepares a final push to destroy ISIS and their largest aircraft character may be motoring its way, although it's difficult to know the truth of these things. It has caused the greatest crisis, the greatest refugee crisis that, that, that we can imagine. And we've got uh, all these refugees. The biggest refugee crisis since World War II, uh, two and a half million of them are in the mountains of Turkey. Over a million in Lebanon. 600,000 in Jordan and all strewn all through Europe and we know the trouble that's caused in Europe and in fact the dissatisfaction over all these refugees arriving in Europe was a factor that influenced the British to vote out. When we come to Iraq we've got a country with a power vacuum. Again to understand Iraq we need to understand that it's about 60% Shia, they're down, they're the green and up North, we've got, or uh, well, the northwest, we've got Sunnis, and right up north, we've got the Kurds. And this, this is an argument that can't easily be solved. Um, and we've got some, some personalities here involved. We've got the current Shiite Ayatollah Sistani, who's in control of part of Iraq now, and we've got the Sheikh Dalami, who's the Sunni Sheikh in the north. And we've got the Kurdish leader, Masoud Bazani. And so you've got these three personalities vying for control of Iraq now that, um, now that uh, the Americans are out. And this uncertainty goes on. You've got influential Kurds now uh, putting their hand up. And in fact, the current 
president of Iraq is a Kurd. The Kurds have, have this inhabited area up the north of both Syria and Iraq, and they're trying to get their own autonomous region. In fact, they have their autonomous region now, but they want it recognised by, by international community. And you've got all these Kurdish uh, personalities having the impact, including the former president and the current president of Iraq are Kurds. And so we have this complex map of Iraq where ISIS also have control. When we look at Libya, which is mentioned in Ezekiel 38, we understand what needs to happen to Libya. Um, getting rid of Gaddafi created another power vacuum that hasn't really been solved at this point. And uh, just a couple of days ago, the United States announced that they were la launching more airstrikes on IS in Syria. And so you've got this war going on in Syria. Again, a proxy cold war between these, these power brokers and we know where, where Libya has to, has to end up. Turkey, well, there's 80 million people that live in Turkey. It's an Islamic country. It's Sunni. But, well, what an uncertain place right now. It is such a, an important country geographically, strategically one of the most important countries in the world, particularly when you look at Russia and their intention to invade the Middle East. Not only geopolitically is it important, but religiously it has an importance. In Istanbul, you've got the Hagia Sophia, that particular building there, which was the home of the Eastern Orthodox Church, the home of, the, of, of Constantinople. It was the place where the Eastern Roman Empire had, had its headquarters religiously. The emperors worshipped in this place. And when the Ottomans took over, they just turned it into a mosque. And this is a struggle between East and West. It's not just a struggle between Shia and Sunni, it's a struggle between, for Christendom. And I, was, I happened to be there last year in July and I took this photo of the ISOP here walking towards it. And I, I was in the very place where ISIS have attacked in that main square in the centre of Istanbul. As a matter of fact, when I was in that square, I met this gentleman, um, whose name is, uh, is Ahmet Dav Dav Davotoglu, who was the Prime Minister at the time, and I shook his hand. I'm not sure if that's going to... I've got a bit of a video there, but it's not going to work, I don't think. But uh, he's been deposed... Well, he, he resigned. He resigned in July last year... Oh, sorry, May this year, I beg your pardon, he, he resigned because of differences with er Erdogan, the president. And so the current Prime Minister is this gentleman, but really the main powerhouse is this man. And uh, he's trying to take Turkey back towards tyranny and Islamic law. But really, Turkey's in, in, a, in a state of flux. And some are predicting it may, may turn into another Syria with... Uh, anything could happen. Really, the, the current coup was about the army who, who support the ideology of, of, of uh, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, who was the general that actually beat the Australians at Gallipoli. He became the first president of Turkey and took Turkey away from Islamic law to, to a more secular state. And uh, the army were very supportive of him. They almost worship him in, in Turkey. This Erdogan is taking it away from secularism towards, back towards Islamic law and the army, are, the, the army can't stand this and, they, and, and that was rather a bleak attempt to take control and get rid of this, this man. Uh, where it will end up, well, we know where it will end up. This, uh, this man who represents Russia has an interest and he actually uh, threatened that it, if, if uh, Turkey didn't uh, stop interfering in Syria, he would restore Istanbul to Christendom, which uh, was just an amazing uh, proclamation. And Russia is, is very keen on securing the Bosphorus, the Sea of Marmara and the Dardanelles so that it can get its ships from the Black Sea, where, it, they're, where they're located, down into the Middle East. We watch this space and uh, just in a few days, Erdogan is travelling to Russia to try to, try to build bridges again. You might remember that they, they shot down a Russian plane and Putin's been asking for an apology ever since, and he got one recently, which has enabled these two men to come together. But it's going to be interesting to see uh, what happens. Uh, the coup has changed everything, really, uh, in Turkey. Can't really even safely travel there now. It's, a, it's in a state of emergency. A state of emergency really just puts the power in the president's hands, uh, as opposed to the government, and he controls the military. But since then, he's sacked 60,000 public servants, teachers, academics... Anyone who 
who has an education almost. It just seems bizarre what's going on there. It's, it's certainly uh, going to be interesting to watch. And uh, Russia has their eyes on that location. And it may be that Russia need to move down to settle things down. Moving briefly to Israel now. We know what to expect in Israel. In Ezekiel 38 it says, I will go up to them that at rest and dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither gut, bars nor gates to take a spoil and to take a prey. Israel will dwell safely and confidently. It will be so wealthy as to be attractive for the invading alliance. In 1 Thessalonians 5, the same message, peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them. Israel are the most advantaged by the dispute between Sunni and Shia. Because while they're fighting, Israel has peace. And while Israel has peace, they have time to build their industry, which leads to prosperity. And as, as we've heard, Putin is a, is a very close friend of the Jews and ha, is a close friend of, of uh, Mr Netanyahu. In fact, the closest thing to a friend Israel has ever had in Moscow. He's a friend of the Jews because he had a lot of friends growing up amongst the Jews and this picture of this woman here was his old high school teacher and he went to Tel Aviv and bought her a unit in Tel Aviv because he remembers her so fondly. And he's a close friend of the chief rabbi of Russia, uh, Beryl Lazar, and he sends him greeting cards and he's well known to be a friend of the Jews. And uh, this particular uh, rabbi uh, said he's a pro-Jewish leader. In fact, he says he's fighting anti-Semitism more vigorously than any Russian leader before him. And so the Jews, even in Russia, are supportive of Putin. And recently, you might have read in the news that an Israeli Defence Force tank was returned by Russia as a, as a sign of friendship. And Netanyahu went to Moscow to pick it up. And there's this uh, increasing ties. Now, Putin may have ulterior motives for this friendship because Israel have discovered oil. A discovery of oil in, in Israel means that the Jewish state could soon produce significant quantities of black coal, gold and potentially change the face of the Middle East. This report says, with, ex, with enormous excitement, the chief geologist said, talked about the immense wealth that it could bring to the Jewish state, which has long yearned for its own resource of black gold. Now, this gold, which is actually uh, this, uh, this oil, which has uh, been found in the in the Golan Heights, is 350 metres thick, when typically uh, thicknesses of oil deposits are 20 to 30 metres thick. So it's 10 times as deep. It is, of course, it, uh, strategic, in a strategic location in the Golan Heights, which is no doubt going to cause some concern for some, up here in the Golan Heights in a place called Cat's Rin. In addition to the oil that's just recently been discovered, Israel, of course, have natural gas deposits, which are huge. We have Leviathan, which is the biggest. We've got Tamar, which is currently online, and they're tapping into that. We have this map here of uh, the, the uh, sea the territory of the sea where these uh, natural gas reserves are to be found. And they are massive and they are going to bring great wealth. The Leviathan natural gas field has 622 cubic metres of natural gas reserves. It's not expected to come online, but Tamar already has. And, you know, Netanyahu and Putin have been talking. Russia is seeking a bigger role in Israel. And it's interesting that it's been reported in their discussions that they're talking about the Leviathan gas fields. Uh, and what stands out is the strong possibility of Russia's Gazprom, their company, developing Israel's Leviathan gas fields. And this has enormous implications for the future of the Middle East. Enormous prosperity for Israel, friendship, peace and safety. With the Saudis, Israel have had five secret meetings, it was reported in June, to discuss a common foe, Iran. Israel and Egypt, President el-Sisi has and he's, uh, he's, has made overtures to Israel, and uh, Benjamin Netanyahu made a, a joint statement when Egyptian Foreign Minister Sami Shukri uh, came to Jerusalem to meet him. Israel and Jordan, uh, moving down into the Sheba and Dedan area, well, they're having discussions about sharing water, electricity and the natural gas reserves, and Jordan's King Abdullah is committed to joint projects with Israel. So it's all coming together before our eyes. It's extraordinary. Just uh, finally, the extraordinary domino effect of ISIS as I see it. ISIS, you know, you think, well, we didn't see ISIS coming. Where did this come from? What's the purpose of it? When I look at it, there are an enormous number of impacts that ISIS has brought. It's like dominoes have fallen over. 
The Middle East has been destabilised and led to these new rivalries and alliances. The second thing is it's engendering violent Shia versus Sunni holy wars. The third thing is that huge numbers of refugees are fleeing Syria and destabilising not only the Middle East but also Europe. The European Union, number four, has destabilised due to these refugees. And, and the fifth point there is that Brexit was probably largely affected by this refugee influx, which, which Europe was struggling to deal with. And, of course, once you got into, into Europe, it was a simple thing to get across the channel to Britain. Saudi Arabia moving further away from Iran and Russia as a consequence of, of what ISIS is doing. Saudi Arabia is increasing their military expendi uh, expenditure. They're now number four. Iran's links with Russia have been strengthened. Iran's needs for weapons are more urgent, and so it pushed their nuclear deal. Saudi Arabia invading Yemen to crush ISIS there. We've got Russian planes brought to Syrian soil. We've got the weakening of the influence of the USA and the strengthening of the Russian presence. We've got ISIS terror track attacks around the world bringing a new se sense of fear and uncertainty. Men's hearts failing them for fear. And yet, with all that, it's bringing peace and a time of stability to Israel. Saudi Arabia, Jordan and Egypt are nurturing relations with Israel. And so, as we conclude our comments, what an extraordinary year we've seen. And the exhortation of Romans 13 comes to mind, knowing the time. It is now high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is fast spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armour of light.